Okay, start again. Oh, okay, yeah, the recording. The speaker today is Dorian Dimitri, and he's going to give us a talk on three enumerative results and their applications. Oh, let me go to presentation moment. Okay, so we were here. So, okay, so people tried to count very early on. Um, and also numerative combinatorics is considered to be one of the earliest substitutes of math, or yeah, maybe the most ancient uh, type of math, if you wish. Uh, but <clears throat> Want to just uh, how to uh, okay. so um but yeah okay I did my uh, dissertation in enumeration and when some layman people asked me what is this all about what do you do and it's usually good to have some short answer you know because if it's more than a couple of sentences they get, uh, it's hard for them to follow. But but my short answer to this question was, okay, we tried to count some things that supposedly are difficult to count, but they also have some importance, some significance. And uh, <clears throat> okay, so first I, I would just give a quick overview of just a few examples of some uh, easy questions that are object of interest for enumerative combinatorics, then two not so easy questions before uh, tell you about my results. But okay, one very natural question is okay if you if I give you a number n, in how many ways can you write it as a sum of other numbers? Right, that's it. Very basic question, and uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, undergrad exercise to see that the answer is 2 to n minus 1. Uh, these are called compositions and there is a nice argument which shows us that this is indeed the answer with the so-called bijection. Uh, it's a bijective proof. So basically yeah, if we have uh, our n bars and if we put uh, certain and dots at the end of some of uh, just to indicate that uh, we are done with each of these ones. Then we have n minus one places between these dots, and depending on whether we pick such a place between uh, two bars or not, uh, we have yeah two options for each of these. So we have two to n minus one, and this is a, a classical example of simple bijective proof. A combinatorial proof and I particularly like these because they give more insight about why certain thing is is true certain fact is true um okay another uh such easy example is okay if we have two by n grid and we want to cover it with dominoes then in how many ways can we do that again a classical problem even used to, as an interview question um and yeah we, we can easily see that the answer is the fibonacci numbers because um yeah the, the answer satisfies the same recurrence and has the same initial conditions and okay but uh <clears throat> here is an example uh which is not that easy as the previous two. Uh, so, <clears throat> okay, if I uh, look at a necklace with certain number of beads, as here with six beads, and if I'm allowed to cover each bead in two, two possible colors, either black or white, that's a very simple settings here. Then, okay, how many different necklaces we could have? Uh, here you see all the 13 necklaces. And um, what is one difficulty in solving this question is that, okay, we 
count certain necklaces as the same necklace. For example, um, if we take a necklace, if we rotate it and get another one, we, we count these two as the same one, right? And also, if we take a necklace, we, we flip it, we also don't count this as, as a different one. So, so basically, we have the set of all coverings of, of our necklaces. And we, in addition, we have a group action on this set, which tells us which of the necklaces we, we consider as equivalent. And we, we want to count the number of group orbits for this group action. Um, and okay, each of these represents uh, one such orbit, each of these 13 necklaces. And okay, this is the general answer, just by, by looking at the formula, you can tell that uh, probably there is no such easy proof as, as in the previous two examples. We have to, to use the so-called POIA theory. Um, <clears throat> Okay, and the final example I would like to give is uh, with the famous Rogers uh, Manujan identities. So there are two such famous identities and many variations for them. Uh, but this particular one is, is nice. And uh, when I show this to some other people, not exactly in commutators, they're kind of amazed. Uh, but okay, it's a... It's, uh, Again, a simple fact with not very simple explanation. So um, if we look at partitions of a number n, so uh, I guess here, since we have combinatorialists, uh, people know what, what are partitions, but these are like compositions uh, with the difference that here, the order matters and we, we start. So, so basically the parts are in decreasing order. Uh, <clears throat> And okay, we, maybe we can look at this example to, to illustrate this fact. So let me pick a number n, let's say nine, and let me see how many partitions I have where all the parts are just plus or minus one mod pi. So the only allowed parts are one, four, six, then nine, 11, and so forth. Um, and okay, for the number nine, I have five such partitions that are given here. At the same time, if I try to look at the, I look at the partitions for nine, but when I don't have consecutive parts, right? So here in these five partitions, I don't have five and four, for example. Five plus four, we don't count. And okay, we, it turns out the answer is again five, and this is not a coincidence. So whatever n you, you choose, if you look at these two quantities, they will be the same. And yeah, that uh, illustrates this first identity of Ramanujan. And okay, some proofs exist. Uh, actually, even Ramanujan himself approved this. Um, and this guy Rogers, it turned out later that Rogers proved it even before Ramanujan, but this uh, came clear after the proof of Ramanujan, if, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but okay, then in the last few de decades, we have several other proofs, but um, there is a, an agreement that there is no really easy combinatorial proof which gives simple satisfying explanation. Uh, and okay, so this was, these were four examples in total. And just a historical remark here, um, enumerative and algebraic combinatorics was not really uh, considered a separate subfield until, uh, maybe the 60s or 70s. Um, and the reason is that, okay, as a branch, it faced lots of criticism, right? That the problems are just ad hoc and, you know, there are no uh, common techniques that can be used in, in some general cases. Uh, 
and yeah, just the lack of unifying theory was was the problem. So these problems were just considered as part of number theory or um, algebra, or whatever. And yeah, this this kind of changed uh, mostly due to Giancarlo Rota, who established very strong group at MIT and attracted some very talented people from Harvard also. And even to this day, uh, MIT is known to, to be the, the leader in uh, and algebraic combinatorics. And uh, the main contributions of Rota were, were that basically developed some, some theory uh, in algebraic combinatorics and in particular in, in these uh, <clears throat> sub areas, so these topics. Um, and yeah, we, we have some specialist in matrix theory here. Some people who are very well aware. Um, POSETS is another big topic, symmetric functions too, as well. Um, <clears throat> Because, okay, what about nowadays? Um, well, there is an agreement again that the field of enumerative combinatorics and algebraic combinatorics became more popular in, in the recent years because of its applications to TCS, to theoretical computer science. And here are two quotes from the website of the Institute of Advanced Study. Uh, the first one, yeah, basically says the same thing that there is rapid development of TCS and yeah, as a result, we have increased interest in, in these combinatorial techniques in general, not just the numerative techniques. And also, yeah, they also say, yes, most of the problems uh, still need some ingenuity and, you know, just case by case considerations, but still um, some powerful toolkit has been developed and there are some deep algebraic tools as well. Um, okay, so now let's move on to the essential part of the talk, uh, the results I will discuss. I will try to discuss three particular results um, and they're related to they're pretty simple to state and to, to understand as, as results. And they're also related to three fundamental tasks in computer science, namely sorting, searching, and then random sampling. And yeah, if we have time, but it seems we probably have, because here the talk is one hour, uh, I will tell you one open problem that I plan to work on, which I'm excited about. Uh, it's it has applications to optimal data structures, and I would just need a single slide to to explain it. Uh, and okay, and on the way as well, I will mention the name of one particular computer scientist uh, scientist three times. So we, at the end, you will know who who is my favorite computer scientist. Uh, so okay, so. Let's start with the first result, the application to sorting. Uh, to understand it, uh, I guess many of you have heard about this course, oh, yeah, but uh, actually Mikos Bona gave a talk about permutation patterns a couple of weeks ago. So, so I yeah, just so skim over I this. Um, but okay, we need permutation patterns to, to state this result oh, and yeah. Okay, what is a permutation pattern? Um, so yeah, if we have certain permutation pi and another permutation of smaller size p, we say that pi contains p as a pattern if there is a subsequence with elements in the same relative order. So we just look at this example. This permutation contains two, three, one as a pattern because of this subsequence in red, right? Three, five, one. And yeah, okay. One is the, the smallest element, it's at the, that place. The, the second smallest is here in front, and then the, the largest is in the middle. And uh, 
Okay, so when we don't have such a subsequence, we say that pi avoids p. Okay, and um, yeah, for instance, again, the same permutation does not have one to three because we don't have an increasing subsequence of length three. <clears throat> okay, and Donald Knut was the first to ask some important question, which turned out to be related with permutation patterns. Namely, okay, if I um, <clears throat> have these classical data structures, DAC, Q, and DEC, then if you just need, if you just try to use each of these to sort permutations, then which permutations can you sort? Uh, that was his question. And for stack, um, he gave the answer, but to illustrate what, what do I mean exactly, let's let's look at this example. So if I give you this permutation, how can you sort it using just a stack? So you can just push and pop elements. So when you pop, you, the element goes to the output. Uh, so, okay, so we want one to be in front, right? So I, I'm forced to push the first two elements, right? Uh, also one, and then I'm just gonna pop one and two. And then, yeah, I need the next to be three, so I'm gonna push four and three, and then I will pop everything, right? So uh, so in that way, we can sort uh, that permutation using a stack. Okay, but again, the question of Knut, particular for stacks, uh, Okay, that was a particular permutation, but which is the set of permutations I can sort using this device? And <clears throat> this is his famous result, uh, which led to the whole development of, of the area of permutation patterns. So basically, you can sort the permutation pi if and only if uh, it does not have this, uh, it does not contain this pattern 2, 3, 1. And one one direction is very easy. So so let's say I try to sort two three one itself. Then I need to to get to the one, right? But before that, I need to push two and three, and then three is above two. So basically, I cannot pop two before three, right? So that's a that's a problem, uh, and. Yeah, the nice thing is it turns out that's also a sufficient condition. So if you, if you avoid this pattern, then you can always sort. Good. So I mentioned these three data structures, stack, Q, and deck. For deck, a couple of years after Knut, we had uh, we have this result. So those permutations that you can sort with the deck also avoid some patterns, but not just one as here, but infinitely many patterns. And you could ask, okay, but this is kind of weird, right? Because with deck, we have more capabilities, right? We can push and pop from both sides as opposed to the stack. And we have to avoid even infinitely many patterns, which, which is surprising. But uh, the twist is that, okay, yeah, infinitely many patterns, but the smallest, the, in size of these patterns is, is of, of length five. So they're pretty big. The, the length of these patterns is, is pretty big. Uh, and yeah, it's it's also an interesting result, but okay, how about the third device? Just with a Q, what can we sort using this simple Q? Well, that's not very interesting, right? This, we can't do much. We can just push and pop elements in the same order, right? So, um, so yeah, that's why people haven't looked um, much at that because there is nothing to look at. But but uh, <clears throat> we can consider modifications of a queue. So this is what uh, what I did. Uh, couple of years ago. So 
What if we consider special types of cues, which can do cuts? And okay, in that project, I considered arbitrary set of uh, shuffling methods that we can apply over the content. But one of the most popular shuffling methods is cuts. So basically, if you have a deck of cards, a cut is just, okay, you take some part of the cards and you move you move that segment in front, right? And um, yeah, to, to illustrate this, let's look at that example again. How can we sort these permutations using cuts? Well, I can push the first two elements and then I can cut in the middle. So when I cut again, as with deck of cards, uh, that segment will move in front. So I, I cut and yeah, I move the two segments. And yeah, they, they become in the right order. And then for three, I just push it and pop it. And then for six, four, five, I it's clear where I should cut, right? There and, and then, uh, yeah, I, I get a sorted permutation. And okay, the obvious, the obvious question I would ask is, Okay, if I use this kind of shuffle cues uh, or cues with, able to perform cuts, then which permutations can I sort? It? And yeah, this is the first result I want to show. It turns out actually here I need to avoid three different patterns uh, in order to have a permutation sortable in this way. Uh, and yeah, one of them is of size three, the other two of size four. And that's not that difficult to, to prove uh, as long as you can formulate this as a conjecture. Um, but yeah, it's, I think, sort of interesting analog in some sense to, to the result of Knut. Um, then I asked, okay, uh, just using such a device once, I can sort these permutations, avoiding these patterns. But what if I'm allowed to use that special cue several times in a row? You know, I, I start with my permutation, I uh, transform it somehow using uh, my special cue, and then I take the output, I uh, move it to the input, and, and again use the cue. Then, okay, first it's easy to, to be shown that I can sort any permutation if I have enough, uh, if I use enough times this device in a row. Um, but of course, the, the question of what's the minimum number of times I should use a, a special queue to sort a given permutation occurs. So, um, that's another result that for whatever permutation you give to me, it suffices to use roughly an over two such passes. Uh, and okay, that was slightly more complicated to prove. Uh, yeah, not that easy. Okay, so I'm then I'm gonna move on to the second problem. Maybe if there are any questions in that. Are there more results like this where you added enough stuff to sort everything? Like the minimal amount of stuff to like for the stack, the minimal amount of stuff to sort everything or something. Like where you can sort everything and you have enough off or something. Oh, you mean I don't other, of other, this other results results or other results of this sort were saying if I have a stack and I have this extra thing, I can sort all permutations or something. Um, yeah, people looked at very several modifications for stack sorting. Um, if you do stack sorting in a row, like several times using the stack, I think it suffices to use. Yeah, I've seen such results, but I don't want to mislead you now, but, but there are there are several such works. And basically after this result of Knut, I mean, even now there is yearly conference on permutation patterns. So, so 
the people work on that the what um is the cost bound tight the this one yeah um yeah yeah it is um But yeah, I think this was asymptotic, right? So, so for small n, sure, yeah, sure. it should be yeah. improved. But is there like a nicely describable structure of the permutation that gets around that over two? I don't think so. Okay. At least, yeah, don't know of such a. Uh, but yeah, it can be hardly improved. It cannot actually. Okay, so yeah, the second uh, problem and result I want to show you is related to searching. It's again kind of a natural problem. Uh, <clears throat> so, okay, what are the settings here? We look at plane trees or ordered trees, as some people in combinatorics like to tell them. Uh, so, <clears throat> we have some fixed ordering of the children for, for each node, right? And so here you see all the all such ordered trees with three edges. And as we know, they are counted by the Catalan numbers. So, so yeah, their number is five, five is a Catalan number. Um, and our goal here would be to do efficient search for random nodes in such trees. Okay, so in particular, what do I mean? So what is our problem? So let's say we are at the root of some of these trees with 10 edges. And there is a, another node in the tree, a target node in the same tree that we want to find. Uh, but we can do much like, for example, when I'm at the word at, at the node, I don't see how many children does this node have. Or the only thing I can do is okay, do you have an unexplored child? Yes. If if the answer is yes, you, you get such a child. And okay, the the question, the general question is how to search for the target X. And when we talk about searching in graphs and trees we immediately think of two algorithms, classical algorithms, breadth first and depth first search, the did in undergrad. And uh, <clears throat> okay, so of course, when we do breadth first search, we, when we are at a node, we, we visit one by one the children first of that current node. Um, and here, with these labels on that picture, you see an example how what would be the order uh, of Bradford search in, in which Bradford search okay. visits the nodes here in that tree. Right? So uh, formally, I introduced this BFS score of a vertex, which is just the number of nodes visited before V when using BFS. And, why, why do I care about this statistic? Well, this basically measures um, the time complexity of BFS when the target node is V, right? So for instance, if my target is this node five, I would do roughly five steps before I reach it, right? Because I will visit, yeah, five nodes before for that. Um, <clears throat> And okay, that's nice. I'm interested in time complexity of algorithms uh, in general when I look at algorithms. So that's a reasonable thing to look at. Um, same thing for, for depth for search. I look at this analogous DFS score for a vertex. So again, yeah, here I, I just go all the, all, all the way to the end. I, uh, get to a new child as long as I can, and when I cannot, I go back. And yeah, I now look at these DFS scores, and 
<clears throat> my question is, okay, my first question, um, the actual question is this one, and it's, it's given here. Um, basically, if my target node is at a, at a fixed level, then which of the two algorithms is a better choice on average? Like, in other words, which will be smaller in expectation, the BFS score or the DFS score, the target? Yes. Yeah. Right first search, I would say. <laughs> uh, depends on the level, though. Uh, for, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, uh, yeah, for very big levels, yeah. probably it would be better to, to go first in depth, right? And and that's that's one nice thing about this question that we have a clear intuition from the very beginning <laughs> about the answer. Maybe when L is small, BFS is better, when L is big, DFS is better, but where exactly is the threshold? That's the question. And, but okay, before looking at that question, let, let me even say something simpler than that. Like if we don't constrain ourselves to the level, if we don't fix the level, if my target is just a random node in my tree, then which of these two expectations is smaller? That's, same, right? yeah, it's the same, right? Because we, we just label the vertices somehow with one to N. And when we take yeah. the average, of course, we have the same same number. So so if if we just look at uniformly at random, tar uniformly random target, the question is not interesting. But here with, with the fixed L, uh, we claim the question is more interesting. And yeah, in this example, L is two. So we look uh, now at the uniform distribution over all these nodes and uh, on that level. So pay attention that now we don't have a uniform distribution over all trees, right? Because some of them don't, don't, don't even have uh, nodes on level two. But okay, the nodes is what we uh, distribution on. Okay, and yeah, as I said, we have that clear intuition. Our question is, where is the threshold? And um, fortunately, we have this result here from the 80s, which basically gives us the total number of nodes on that level, uh, this fixed level. So we're interested in the expectations, right? So we these are some averages over all these nodes on that level. So, so now, since we know the total number of these nodes, the only thing we care about is these total summations of DFS and DFS cores, <laughs> right? For, for these nodes on level L. So, uh, yeah, we basically we need to compute these and compare them, right? For for different L's in order to answer which of the algorithms is faster in expectation. And <clears throat> here's the first result. So it turns out for the sum total D, the sum of all DFS scores for these nodes, we have this very simple expression. Um, it's not that immediate to prove this though. Uh, so, yeah, I here usually I like to say that you know I, I've heard once that every talk should contain at least one proof and one joke, and uh, we should hope that they don't coincide. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I already I just gave my joke, so let me give you the proof uh, sketch uh, of this. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a surprisingly simple formula, but what we do basically is, okay, we have these trees and we map each tree to a dike path. Um, and there is a well-known bijection for that, right? So basically, it comes from the DFS traversal of the, the tree. So basically, if we go, yeah, it's more visible here. So. If we start at the root, we do DFS, so we should go down three times, right? Uh, like we go away from the root, this is an up step, 
if we go back closer to the root, this is a down step. So that's why we start with three or sorry, four up steps. Right. So we open it up before you first go away four times, then we go back and, and so forth. And at the very end, when we traverse with DFS, we should go back to the root. So, so that's why we, we end up uh, at level zero again. And uh, yeah, okay, we have this classical bijection, but what is nice about this map is that basically we are interested in these nodes on this fixed level L um, and the corresponding DFS scores for them. And it turns out that the DFS score of that node here is just how many up steps we do uh, in, in this segment, the, the prefix. Uh, and basically we wanna count this. To do that, we first need to take all these dig paths and for each of these nodes on level L to multiply by by the number of up steps in the prefix. So yeah, this is just the number of up steps in the prefix. And what remains is to count the pairs of big paths here and this other path. So as long as we count these pairs, uh, we are good. So we can multiply by that number. So um, yeah, and another good thing is that for these paths, um, we know their number, right? So if we start at a given point, if we want to go to another point, this is very well studied. Uh, uh, these what is paths and the numerative aspects of them. Uh, so in particular, um, we can even derive such a formula for the number of these paths ourselves uh, using very neat lemma called the psycho lemma. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, I won't go into much details here, but um, basically, okay, from that lemma, we, we get an expression for these when we plug these back in that, uh, in that summation. And when we simplify, after we simplify, we it turns out to prove our uh, claim, we have to prove this identity. And yeah, we found a projective proof for, for this identity. Um, basically both sides count certain number of what is parts. Um, and yeah, okay, so that's why we, we have that simple formula for total D. How about total B, the summation overall BFS scores? Well, yeah, here, the quest was more complicated. So we used generating functions. And in particular, this one, I, again, won't go into much details about it, but basically we keep track of two things, right? How many nodes we have at level L and how many nodes do I have at smaller levels? And, <clears throat> Having these two quantities, uh, basically introducing this FL, these generating functions, we have one of these for each L. Uh, we can show that this is true. The generating function for, for actual total B that we want to find, uh, we have this equation and it turns out, so here we did some calculations, some you know, maple uh, code was written. Uh, yeah, this was actually a collabor in collaboration with two other people. And one of them was um, very good with maple. Uh, but what is interesting at the end is that it turns out these FL and BL, these uh, generating functions can be expressed with these nice Fibonacci polynomials, which related to they count certain pilings, dominant pilings. And also the classical kata one generating function. In particular, this is what we showed. Uh, some found some expressions in terms of these Fibonacci polynomials and 
and the cathode generated function uh, for this FL and BL. And of course, we utilize this uh, to apply Lagrange inversion and to find uh, some summation formula for total B. So this is what we got for total B. It's not very pleasant. I mean, at first glance, it's not that huge, but these alternating signs are annoying. Uh, we, we can't really, it's hard to evaluate the asymptotics of this, and especially when you have two such. So again, our goal was to compare that quantity with what we had for, for total D, right? That binomial coefficient time L, because we wanted to say which of the two algorithms is better on average. So this expression couldn't quite work for us, right? So, uh, so yeah, we decided to write it in a different way. Let's see, I should hurry up. So we started a little bit later, right? Yes, we say got to the twelve ten. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so we found this alternative way to write total B, uh, which is more like what we had for total D. Right. So now again, such a binomial coefficient pops up. What we had, what we have in front though, is again a bit problematic because, okay, we have a ratio of two polynomials, but yeah, the top one is of smaller degree, degree uh, L minus one. The bottom one is degree L. Uh, but the issue is that these coefficients of PL in the numerator, they depend on L. And on top of that, okay, yeah, they, they grow really quickly, these coefficients. I uh, yeah, usually show here a table showing these coefficients, but yeah, they grow really quickly. And so, okay, if L, if my level is just a constant compared to N, then this result uh, basically allows me to compare to, to evaluate asymptotically this, right? Because, okay, um, the ratio of this, these two, um, yeah, I mean, the numerator is significantly smaller than the denominator if L is a constant. Um, so yeah, basically, now this gives me that for a constant level, BFS is better. But okay, I want something more. I want to look at the cases when L is a function of N, right? Growing uh, with N. Uh, so I needed to rewrite this total B thing uh, in a third way. Uh, yeah, by the way, here it's interesting that we proved the leading coefficient of this numerator is given by this formula, which rings a bell, you know, the, the sum of the first L squares. Uh, but yeah, we, we couldn't find a connection with the sum of the first L squares. However, we proved that this is the leading coefficient and it turned out the key to that uh, was to prove this identity, which in turn uh, holds because of that theorem, that identity. And yeah, this has a nice combinatorial proof that we found. Uh, basically, this, this counts again some tilings, domino tilings of a strip one by n. But basically, okay, this coefficient counts some tilings with some properties. And then for the remaining tilings, we, we do a involution, uh, which is called sign reversing involution, um, where we we, we got uh, the left side. Um, but anyway, so why is this leading coefficient important? Because we later use that fact, uh, namely this identity, to, um, to rewrite total B. 
uh, yeah, this slide says just what I mentioned that this uh, coefficients of in PL depends on L. So <clears throat> yeah, the final way for us to rewrite total V was, was this one. So it's even less pleasant, uh, but uh, the nice thing about this uh, expression is that those H's here, these quantities, they are bounded uh, when L is uh, symptotically smaller than root N or okay, B co of root N. Um, and yeah, just this fact that these are bounded allowed us to find bounds for total B. Uh, so in particular, we showed this. So um, yeah, asymptotically, total B behaves as this function for some constants. And long story short, this allowed us to basically show that, okay, if the level uh, is asymptotically smaller than root n, then BFS is better in expectation. And in, in addition, we have a threshold at constant times root n for some c. We couldn't find the c, but uh, we found there is such a threshold where DFS becomes better after that. Um, so, okay, but this is just, uh, so so remember our expression was just in that case when a is big O of root n. So if this is not the case, we couldn't say much. Uh, and we don't even know whether this is the only threshold. So um, yeah, some exper experiments uh, shown here indicate that, okay, probably we have a unique threshold. Right, this is the ratio of total B and total D. And you see this graph crosses Y equals one at the single place, right? And here N is two, 200 and okay, this, this is roughly around 14, which is like root 200. Um, and yeah, okay, we suspect that there is a unique such threshold but we have some ideas how to prove that using some uh, results of David Aldous uh, about limiting trees and you know some probability stuff. Uh, but yeah, we still don't know. Uh, but yes, it's a, it's a nice project. What is also interesting about this result? is that the average height of these ordered trees is roughly root n. So that's, again, a, an old result of the bruin knut rice um, So what we suspect, as I said, is that we have a single threshold around root n. So it, it turns out that most probably these, these two algorithms are so natural, BFS and DFS, that Okay, until the average height, BFS is better. After the average, DFS is better, which is interesting. And um, I personally want to check whether this is not, whether this is a coincidence or not, whether it's true for other families of trees, maybe binary trees or stuff. And um, I started working on that with the PhD students uh, for binary trees, but we will see. Um, <clears throat> And okay, the final quick uh, result I wanted to show is about the third um, uh, important task in computer science, which is random sampling. Uh, and yeah, even if you couldn't quite follow or just you didn't follow so far, uh, it's not late because this would be independent from the previous stuff, but <clears throat> okay, so here we have a big question again, how to generate trees uniformly at random. And okay, when I say trees, of course you would ask what kind of trees, but 
the nicer thing is that, okay, if we can generate one kind of trees, let's say uh, order trees, we have very well-known bijections between the different families of trees. So I can just generate random object from one family and map it to, to three of another kind, right? So here, for instance, yeah, maybe you don't see the label from this, but okay, these are all full binary trees uh, with four leaves. And on the left, you have all binary trees with three nodes. And yeah, okay, both of these are counted by the cutoff number five. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, more or less, these families of trees are counted by the cutoff numbers. Uh, <clears throat> so, okay, when I say binary tree here, I mean that for each node, you have either zero, one, or two children, right? Whereas here on the right, I have either zero or two, right? So these are full binary trees. Um, and this picture itself illustrates a simple map between the two families. So, for instance, Take this guy, uh, make that, make such that all nodes here have exactly two children, right? So maybe just add two children here and, and two children there, you will get that, right? And apply the same procedure for each of these five, you get the five on the right. Um, so, yeah, this is in confirmation of what I just said, that we have simple, well-known maps between these families. Uh, so again, if I want to generate such, a, such an object at random from one family, it's enough for me to, to do that for, for a single family. And then I can assume I can do it for the other families. And OK, I will talk about generating a random full binary. So, so yeah, full binary tree with given number of leaves. This is what I would generate uh, at random. <clears throat> and yeah, this is what I just said. Cut on numbers count. Uh, these, these trees. Okay, so basically the widely known algorithm, the most used algorithm for generation of such trees is uh, an algorithm I will discuss briefly now. It's called, uh, it's named after a French mathematician, Remy. Uh, this is in the 80s. And it's extremely simple thing. What he did is extremely simple. So he said, okay, the cutoff number formula is this one, but we can rewrite it recursively in this way. So these two are equivalent, basically. Having the initial conditions, this I can get the same formula, right? And, <clears throat> okay, but this one, he basically interpreted these quantities here in a very natural way. So. So in particular, this is what he did. He said, okay, um, if you have a random full binary tree with n plus one leaves, right? This is what cn plus one counts. Then, <clears throat> okay, and you have n plus one leaves, but also n internal uh, nodes, so in total, you have two n plus one nodes. Just pick one of these at random and pick also a direction, either left or right. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, so sorry, sorry. So with n plus one leaves, this is counted by cn. So we are at, on the right, let's say. And we pick one of these nodes of, of that tree. Uh, counted here at random, and then also direction, either left or right. And uh, we move that node 
in that direction and add a leaf in the other direction. So what what is gonna happen? We will get a full uh, binary tree with one more leaf, right? Uh, M plus two leaves. Now, um, <clears throat> so just to be convinced, this is an example. So if we start, this is by the way, uh, how we can generate a random such tree, right? At the beginning, we start with a single node and we apply this procedure multiple times. That's the claim that at the end, we will get a random object. Uh, and it's not very difficult to prove. Uh, so, so, okay, so I'm here, I should pick a random node. I have no choice, I pick this one. And then I other a direction, let's say uh, left. So I move this to the left, right? Uh, and then in the other direction, I add another leaf. Um, and okay, then I if I keep going, now I have this tree. Let me pick a random node. Um, so uh, yeah, let's say I pick this one, the circled one. Uh, I move it to the direction I, I selected, let's say left again, and in the other direction I add a leaf. And and so forth. Now here this is circle, so I pick that node and okay, direction is right. So um yeah, I generated my next P. Uh and yeah, it's remarkable that this is a very simple procedure and it, it gives us actually a, a random such object. Okay, so that, that was a well-known algorithm. What is, is new, what is I- Is it, I get the right thing, I don't know. What the last step? What did you do exactly? Uh, uh, yeah, let's see. Aha, uh -huh, yes, yes. So, so yeah, the, the, I think that note, the direction is right. So I move the entire thing on the right. I see, okay. Yeah, and then I add the lead. Yeah. Right. Um, so, okay, basically what I did in relation to that is to do it for forests. I generalized this uh, neat algorithm for forests. Uh, okay, when I say a forest, I mean just a list of such full binary trees, which, however, what I want is the total number of leaves in these trees to be a given number. And what I was also surprised to know, to get to know, is that Catalan himself, uh, in his paper where he introduced the Catalan numbers, he actually introduced these numbers, uh, which are generalized Catalan. So, so if you if you plug in k equals two, I think, and you, after you simplify, you get the Catalan numbers. Mm. And, uh, okay, so basically, um, there is a similar recurrence for these generalized numbers, which is given here. And yeah, I basically gave a, a bijective proof of that one similar to, to the bijective proof of Remy. Of course, it was a bit more complicated. Here you have pairs of nodes for a forest, uh, this kind that here, you have a, one of the leaves and one of the internal nodes. So these are the interpretations. These terms, but it works out well. Like, um, yeah, basically, we here we pick two random nodes and then uh, we move what is below the first node below one of the children of the second. So that's the general idea, but somewhat technical to to write it. But yeah. Uh, so yeah, and the nice thing is that this also gives linear time and space algorithm for sampling of 
rich forests and the algorithm of Premi is also linear, which, which is nice. Uh, there are some other algorithms which are n log n uh, uh, more yeah, direct. Um, and yeah, that was the third one, I guess. I might have a few more minutes to tell you about this open problem I promised. Uh, yeah, I said it can be explained on a single slide. So this is the slide. Um, so, okay, I, I have at least three reasons to be excited about this problem. Um, the first reason is a simple formulation. So, so here it is. So give me a permutation, let's say this one, and then construct these, these two trees, so-called increasing and decreasing trees. So, so how do I construct the increasing tree? I, I look for the maximum element, seven here, and then this max element divides my permutation into two parts, right? So then recursively on the left and on the right, I do the same, the very same thing. Right, so here on the left, I have four, six, three, one. So six is the maximum, I put it on top. And then again, recursively on the left, on the right, I do the same end. Uh, the very same way I can do the decreasing three where the minimal elements are uh, the roots, right? So start with the minimum at the root and recursively do the same on the left and the right end. Okay, what is the question? So if I give you a, a pair of trees, uh, here I forgot the labels, if you notice, right? So if I just give you these two trees without any labels, then how many permutations map to this pair? That's my question. And um, i tell you my first reason to like it. It's obviously simple to formulate. The second reason is that it has a very nice implication. So if we solve this problem, um, it's related to a, an important task in computer science, which is related to, you know, big arrays of data, uh, so-called range min and range max queries. So basically, you have a very big array and you know in advance that the only thing you want to do with this array is, okay, in certain interval, in certain seg segment in this array, give me the index of the maximum element or the minimum element. So at the very beginning, you know, these will be all your uh, tasks for this array. So, uh, and what you want is to come up with certain structure, some data structure representing the array, which will be easier to traverse and uh, easier to, to give the results of these queries instead of traversing the whole array every single time. Um, and anyways, this this is related to, to these pairs of trees because having such a pair gives such a data structure. Uh, anyway, so so that was my second reason to like the question. It's, it has a, an important application. Uh, and the third reason, I want to mention is that, um, okay, of course, when I heard it first, I was like, okay, but isn't this already known? Of course, so we should first verify it, so it's not known. So, and it was last year, like exactly one year ago. And uh, I noticed just one week after Donald Knut gave a lecture about this very same topic, not this problem, but again, these twin trees. And I noticed he has written several things about these twin trees. And I just decided, okay, that, that would be faster if I just ask him, you know, whether, whether this is known or not, maybe he knows. But you might probably know that he doesn't use email. <laughs> so, so yeah. Um, 
Um, however, what you see here is an email uh, from his secretary, actually. <laughs> uh, so the way it works is you write him a physical email, a physical mail, sorry, with USPS, you know. And if he thinks it's urgent or important enough to answer you, he just tells his secretary to reply via her email. Uh, so yeah, that was just a nice uh, non-mathematical thing I decided to, to share. But uh, basically, okay, what he says here in the email is that um, doesn't know whether it has been resolved, but yeah, he also suspects that the answer might be interesting in some sense. And yeah, he suggests to, to ask uh, this other person in France uh, who actually came up with this concept of twin trees. Uh, I asked him as well, but yeah, he also doesn't know. So most probably it's, it's a wide open question. And yeah, you can also note how he uh, <coughs> finished his email. This, if you compute that, this is 2023. So yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Nice <laughs> greeting because it was just before the new year, uh, yeah, one year ago. So, yeah, that was pretty much it. At the end, I wanted to advertise a new seminar for open problems. I'm co organizing it, uh, it's an online seminar. If you have graduate students or you yourself are interested to share an open problem, we are happy to. Uh, to take you. Um, and in general, I, I believe sharing open problems on seminars is something that should be encouraged and because, you know, there is always a challenge in this case. More the motivation is higher, whereas if you just listen about already established results, it's not uh, maybe that's that interesting for many people. Um, and yeah, that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Let's take questions, but you can stop the Zoom recording if you want. Thank you. Where is the? Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs>